Welcome to the first Comics and Digital Culture panel here at Emerald City Comic Con. And uh, you guys are the few, the proud. Uh, in coming years, when this becomes like a big ticket event, the number of people who claim that they were in this room for the very first presentation is, uh, you know, we're going to have a hard time counting all those people. But in the meantime, you guys are actually here. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rob Salkowitz. I am author of Comic-Con and the Business of Pop Culture. I'm also an instructor in the Communication Leadership Program at the University of Washington. And the Communication Leadership Program is a program for professionals in areas like media and marketing and communications and entertainment and journalism and comics to learn more about their trade and how to succeed as uh, communicators and builders of community in a digital world. And the goal of our program today is to take a look at the exciting ways that comics is moving as a medium as it evolves from print to screen. Uh, how is this changing the business of comics? How is this changing the art of comics? And how is this changing the way that, that we, the fans and the audience, enjoy these stories? So we've got a slate of four speakers who are each in their own way uh, driving innovation in different areas of the business. Um, later today, we'll be hearing from uh, Liam Sharp, who uh, has a company called Madefire that does motion books, which is bringing comics to life on tablets through the addition of motion and sound effects and things like that, and actually creating a new way to extend the medium and extend the audience. We're going to hear from Allison Baker, who is the co-publisher of Monkey Brain, which is a digital comics imprint that is giving independent creators and creators who don't want to deal with the established publishing structures a voice and a platform to get heard through digital distribution. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, the uh, Colin Go and Yen Yen Wu, who are the creators of this awesome, really interesting digital app uh, called Dim Sum Warriors, which is a bilingual manga app for kids and for other people um, to learn English and Mandarin uh, while enjoying some terrific stories. Those are all coming up later. But coming up right now is somebody who is uh, truly one of the great innovators in the, in the business and the art of comics um, as the founder, uh, sorry, co-founder of IDW, founder or co-founder? Co-founder of IDW, which has been around for 15 years now, now celebrating its 15th anniversary. IDW um, is a great company in all kinds of ways across the comic spectrum, whether you are a collector like me who likes the artist edition and deluxe uh, archival stuff that they put out, whether you're a reader of the best contemporary work like Lock and Key and 30 Days of Night, um, or whether you are a fan of licensed properties like My Little Pony and Transformers, um, which are broadening the comics audience. Um, so Ted has uh, driven uh, IDW into one of the leading uh, publishers and now a cross-media entertainment company, um, and he is going to be talking today about one of his uh, one of the most exciting things coming out from IDW uh, in this year, which is a, um, called V Wars, uh, which is going from uh, books to comics to all kinds of different things. So, without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Ted Adams. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I think we lured most of you here with a free copy of VWAR, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, but what Rob asked me to talk about today was digital culture. And so when we think about digital culture in the world of comic books, I think that's traditionally thought of as an ebook because that's, that's sort of the most na natural transition from a print book into an ebook, so you can read it on your, on your iPad or your Kindle. But I wanted to take a step back and think about what, what could digital culture mean? What's a different way to define digital culture, maybe in a, in a bigger way, in a broader way? So the way I'm going to define digital culture, and I think I get to do that first because there's not that many people here, and I'm the first speaker, so uh, I'm going to define that for the group and, and uh, the other guys can decide if they want to uh, follow along or not. So digital culture is the two words, digital and culture. So I want to take a look at digital first, and clearly something has to be a non-physical product to be considered digital. So we have to interact with it in a non-physical way. So that, that obviously means that it's a screen. So let's, let's assume that digital means that you're interacting with something on a screen. So I think that's a fair, a fair look at digital, but the problem with that, as you're probably thinking in your head, is, is that that would then include potentially movies and TV, right? Because you, you interact with a movie on a screen, you interact with TV on a screen, 
And I, I think that's too, that, that's too big of a definition at that point because when we're thinking digital, I think part of also what we're thinking about is the fact that it's more modern, more current than, than watching a movie from 100 years ago. So I'm going to put an arbitrary defining date on when, when you can start watching something on your screen and still have it be defined as digital. And my date is 1980. And this, again, is my arbitrary date. Anybody have a guess what happened in 1980? There's not many people. I see some. Yep. All right. What happened in 1980? That's close. Yeah, that's exactly. So it was sort of the start of computers. And one of the big ways that computers started was via video games. So um, you're, you probably don't even recognize this too much, but sometimes like if you go to a pizza parlor, you'll see an, a video game that you play. You put quarters in and you play. In 1980, Pac-Man came out as a console video game. And I think that that's really the first time that there was a, not, maybe not necessarily the first time, but it was that time that we started interacting something with something digitally in a different way, which then leads to the next part of digital culture, which is, of course, culture. And the way I'm defining culture is something that you, something that, that becomes part of our conversation. It becomes part of the zeitgeist of America, meaning that for some reason, all of a sudden, we're all talking about Flappy Bird, right? So I don't know exactly how that happens, but it just becomes part of our communication. Back in 1980, Pac-Man was that first thing from a digital standpoint that became part of that conversation. And, and even more than that, Pac-Man became something, I wore a Pac-Man t-shirt and I listened to the Pac-Man Fever song and saw the Pac-Man TV show and was completely immersed in Pac-Man. Um, frankly, I was obsessed with Pac-Man. I definitely had Pac-Man Fever. So, um, so, so that's how I see digital culture, something that we interact with on our screen. But then if we're going to truly call it culture, it has to also be something that takes that next step into either another form of media or just becomes part of our overall conversation. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be on a t-shirt because I, I think Flappy Bird is another good example because there's no, to my knowledge, there's no merchandise around Flappy Bird, but that really stepped into, the, into our culture because for whatever reason, as a community, we all decided to start topic, talking about Flappy Bird um, in a way that, uh, that still goes on today. So, so that's how I'm defining digital culture. Uh, I am going to give you a little overview for IDW. How many, um, how many people here are familiar with IDW? Are you anybody here familiar with our books? Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you a little overview of that. Rob talked a little bit about what we do. We're the number four publisher of comic books in the U.S., um, sometimes the number three publisher of comics in the U.S., and, and we've held that number four spot for the last three or four years. We're no question the number one publisher of licensed comics. I see Dr. Who over here. We, uh, we did Doctor Who for a long time, um, so there are Doctor Who comics that you could, uh, you could check out, either physically or on your reading device of choice. Um, and we're the fastest growing publisher in North America, and that's not just me saying that, that's Diamond Comics who, uh, who verifies that for us. So we do lots of licensed comics, and one of the things that I think is interesting about digital culture, and specifically the digital culture of comic books, is that I am primarily in the business of manufacturing physical product. So the vast majority of my revenue comes from me making physical books that you then buy in comic stores or bookstores or Amazon. So I'm not, I'm not truly a digital publisher. I'm a publisher. So my physical product exists, and then my digital product exists. And what I think is interesting about that is, is that they, they sort of go in waves around each other. So there's, no, there's not just a physical book. There's also a digital book. And they don't have to come at the expense one doesn't have to come at the expense of the other. I think a lot of times when we talk about publishing and you think digital, the expectation is, is that, oh, well, digital is going to happen and therefore people don't want to buy books anymore or they don't want to buy comic books anymore. And what we've learned is that's just simply not the case. If anything, they really support each other. So the success of our digital business and our ebook distribution has come at the same time that we've had extraordinary growth with our physical books. So one one format is supporting another, and they don't have to be, there doesn't have to be this dividing line or this giant wall between physical product and digital product. They can coexist, and they do coexist, and they can help support each other. So, uh, and one of the things that if you, if you look at our partnerships here, some of the things that we've taken from a digital content standpoint, if you look at EA or you look at Microsoft uh, or Sony or some of these products or 2K, those all existed primarily as video games. So in the case of EA, we did, um, we did a Dead Space comic book with them. So that was a video game, did very clearly a digital product, became part of the digital culture. Not, I, wouldn't, I would argue not, certainly not at the level of Flappy Bird, but Dead Space is, a, is sort of part of the community. Uh, people know that. So we were able to take things from that digital space and then make a physical product out of it in the form of a comic book and a trade paperback. But then it went back to digital because it started as a video game. We made a physical book. 
that physical book is then available as an ebook as well. So it goes digital, physical, digital, and that's what I mean about the waves. You, it doesn't have to be just digital, just physical. They really, they really work together. Uh, and, and this is an example specifically of that in the form, we do Transformers comics, uh, and we've been doing them for a very long time. Transformers as a physical brand is very successful for us. It's also one of our, uh, probably our top brand for eBooks. It's uh, in, the, in the form of Amazon and Apple. It's, it's always at the top of the list for us. And this is a program that we did called Dark Cybertron, which was a crossover in our comic books. So Dark Cybertron is, is essentially a new version of Megatron and, and uh, Optimus Prime. And what's nice about this is this, this exists in lots of physical and lots of digital formats. So it actually starts in the physical format of a toy. So you see you've got Megatron there. That's, it's, the picture's not exactly clear, but that's an actual action figure. So you can buy that action figure if you're, if you're a kid and you just want the toy. You got the toy. But what's nice about this is we threw in, well, we didn't. Hasbro threw in a comic book. So you get the action figure. You get the comic book. You can interact with your, you can play with your toy, you can reenact those scenarios with the comic book, so you have this very physical experience, this very, this very tangent, you know, this physical tangential experience that you can have between the comic and the toys, in the same way that I played with my Star Wars toys and reenacted those, you know, those movies. But that's not the only way it exists. It, 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 can, it also exists in the form of ebooks. so if you want to, if you like the toy, you like the comic book, you can then read the rest of the story as an ebook. So you can go and read that, download it to your iPad or your, to your Kindle and read it that way. And then it goes one step even further. There's actually a video game app tied into this storyline. So now there's another digital version. doesn't exist as a physical product. There's a, a digital-only app for Dark Cybertron. And so, so it's this really nice way, I think, of looking again at these waves of physical and digital. Very, you know, nothing gets more physical than a toy. That's a, that's, you know, that's, that, that's a product you can hold in your hands and play with. You have your physical books. You can also read those as ebooks, and then you can play that game. And what's nice about all this, again, is that it all supports each other. There's cross-promotion between all of these things. So there's cross-promotion. The comic book that you get with the toy has information on our apps. The apps always have information on how to get a hold of comic stores and how to be able to reach those comic stores. And so there's this nice, just this nice flow of content, which is the way I think you should look at it. If you look at, if you look at it again, if you, if you think about what I said about waves, and if you think of the content as the water, it's, it's the, the content sort of flowing through all these different waves. And so it flows through the, through the wave of the comic books, and then it flows through the wave of the graphic novel, and then through the wave of the ebook and the toy and the app, all these things coexisting together and building the brand and introducing that story to new people in that way. So the license business is a big part of what we do. Uh, Rob mentioned we're also a, a, a creator-owned company, meaning that we publish creator-owned comics. Our first big success in the world of creator-owned comics was a book called 30 Days of Night. Um, you may have seen that movie, which uh, was the first thing that we had taken from a book and then, and then turned into another form of entertainment in, in the case of the uh, big 30 Days of Night movie. But we've always had a long line of creator-owned books. Our probably best-known creator-owned book at this point right now is a book called Lock and Key, which if you like comic books and you haven't read, is a book you should read. Um, I'm, I'm not a huckster, but uh, that is a book that's worth your time. And these are some of the creator-owned books that we're going to be launching in 2014. Um, and V-Wars we're going to come back to, and V-Wars is the book that you're holding. We're actually doing V-Wars as a free comic book day book, so you'll be able to get that comic book for free on, um, on free comic book day, the first Saturday in May. Uh, although you have to, I see a lot of kids here, you have to be an adult to read this one. It's definitely not, to, not for the kids in the room. Um, although we do have a nice kids comic here, which is Little Nemo in Slumberland. And Little Nemo was actually a comic strip back around the turn of the century in like 1910 to 1920s. And by this guy, Windsor McKay, who was a artistic genius in a variety of ways, but uh, particularly as a, as, a, as a comic strip artist. And what we're doing is bringing that back in the form of a new comic book drawn by Gabe Rodriguez, the artist from Lock and Key. So it's kind of a sneak peek at our, our creator-owned business. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this product line, because I was talking to you about how there doesn't have to be an, an either-or with physical or digital. But here's a case where actually this can only exist as a physical product. Our, our artist editions, if you're not familiar with them, are gigantic books. So they're, they can be this big, literally. Like they can, the trim size on these books can be this big. They're like two and a half feet tall. And the reason for that is what we're doing here is we're reproducing original art at the size the artist drew it. So it's, it's like the art came right off the artist's drawing table and we bound it up and put it into a book. And so this is a really unique experience. If you're interested in the history of comic art and you, or you're interested in learning how to become an artist, this is a way for you to be able to see what the artist's work looks like 
right when it came off his table. It's got the white out, it's got the blue lines, it's got his pencil marks. This is, this is uh, really a revolutionary product that uh, some of my uh, not-to-be-named competitors are now stealing uh, for their own, but uh, uh, our artist edition were the, were the first here. But this, you know, why, why I have this here is this, this is probably one of the few things that we do that can't be done digitally. There's no, there's no digital version of this. You can't, the whole point of this is to be able to hold it and look at it and, and pretend like you're taking this right off that artist's drawing table. So you can't, you can't do this digitally. Although we do joke, uh, as for an April Fool's joke we were going to do this year, although I, I put the kibosh on it, we were going to, the editor of these books is a guy named Scott Doonbear, and we were going to do a picture of Scott Doonbear with a giant iPad, like pretending like he was holding like this like three foot tall iPad and pretend like that was going to be the first uh, digital artist edition. So, uh, but we're not doing that. So, um, so digital publishing. So like I said before, when you think about publishing and you think about digital culture, this is where, this is where your mind goes first. And, We've, uh, I believe, had a leadership role in the digital publishing of comic book content. We were the first major publisher to be in the app store with comic book content. And we did this around the first Star Trek movie that came out. And the, this was back before there were iPads. There weren't even really all that many smartphones. A lot, in a lot of cases, we were selling content so that people were reading it panel by panel on tiny little screens on a flip phone. So that's, that's how far back we're going technology-wise. So we were the first, the first company to do that with our Star Trek comics. Um, and then lots of people came in and decided to specialize in that business. And if I had a time machine, I, of course, would go back and, and um, take it the next step further. We saw the opportunity, and we sold a lot of content that way. But what we didn't do was we didn't then decide that we were going to create a storefront. What we were doing was, at that time, cr selling individual comics via these, via these phones. And the, the real opportunity, which Comixology has, um, in large measure, captured, is that storefront idea. So it's the comic store on your device. And so we, we didn't quite see it that far ahead. And, and you know, thank goodness Comixology has done a great job for that, of that for us uh, and for everyone. So um, our digital business is about 10% of our total business. So like I said, I'm still primarily a physical product manufacturer, the, the, the VWARS book you're holding, that's very similar to what we do. It's a, it, you know, I, I typically make my revenue from something that you can hold in your hands, meaning that you can hold the physical product in your hand, not just the device in your hands. This is a little overview on what our content looks like digitally. So we have published uh, just under 3,000 comics. And when it says that there are 12,000 SKUs, what that means is those 3,000 comics are available on multiple devices and via multiple storefronts. So you can get them through iOS, you can get them on Kindle, you can get them on Nook, you can get them pretty much any place that you can read an ebook. our content's going to be there. Um, and we have a big partnership with Comixology, of course. They're the, the biggest player uh, for comic book content in a digital format. And the nice thing about Comixology is it allows you to buy it from them and read it across devices. It's really, you know, so you buy it on, say you buy it through your through your iPad, you can then go read it on your computer, you can read it on your iPhone, you can read it however, however you want. Once you, once you own that digital content, it's yours to, to read in whatever format you want. And then as I said, we're, we're on pretty much every device at this point, and we're going to be on some new interesting devices that I, that I hope to be able to talk about this summer. There are, I believe, uh, and since there's not that many people here, I'll give you a teaser, and Rob can uh, see if he can figure it out. I, I think there's a, another way to read comics digitally, which is in a bigger way. Um, and maybe on a much bigger screen. So I'll leave it at that. Um, another product that we do that we launched this year that is the other thing that we do that is a physical only product are the micro fun packs. So what a micro fun pack is, and it's a little, a little hard to tell here because you can't get the size perspective. So we do the artist editions that are huge. We also do these micro fun packs, which you probably guessed by the name are not huge. They are about this big. So they're about five inches tall. They're much smaller than a traditional comic book. And they're packaged like a trading card. So you can sort of see in the, the picture there what they look like when they're in their package. And essentially, this is all designed for kids. This is, this is uh, a product that was designed for mass merchants, so meaning Target, Toys R Us, Walmart, Fred Meyer, Kmart, those kinds of places. If you, if you have kids or if you like these uh, sorts of things, there's, a, there's always a trading card section at mass. Uh, at all these stores. And so this product was designed to be able to sold, be sold in that trading card section. And it's designed with that same collectible mentality. So there are four comics to collect here in the micro fun packs, but there's also all this other content in there. You can see in the picture on the bottom, there's a big fold-out poster, there's stickers, there's tattoos. 
So the kids, they can actually see the comics they're getting because the, the, the cellophane is see-through. So you, you don't have to, you're not getting a blind purchase when it comes to the comic book, but you are getting a blind purchase on those other collectible elements. So if you want all the tattoos, you want all the poster sheets, you're going to have to keep buying these in the same way that, that you used to have to be, buy trading cards. And so this doesn't, there's no digital version of this. The whole point of this is, again, it's, it's physical nature and that ability to collect and collect those posters and collect those tattoos. It's all about the physical product here. But what's good about this, though, again, is, is it, it does allow us to be able to promote our, the digital version of the product. So if, you, if the kids that buy these comics, there's marketing at the back of the book that then drives them to our apps. And so they can then, if, you, you know, if the kid likes this little My Little Pony comic book, there's an opportunity for her to go and have her parent download it for her on her iPhone or iPad or other devices. So, so there is, while this is not a digital, there's no digital version of this, it does have that wave again, physical product leading to digital product in our perfect world. Uh, so I'm going to just quickly go through some other divisions that we do and, and, um, uh, and then talk about VWARS a little bit. And VWARS started as part of our prose uh, line. So we are, of course, primarily a comic book and graphic novel publisher. That's what the world knows us for best. But as you can see with the book that you're holding, we also do some prose books. In the case of VWARS, what this is is a collection of short stories edited by the author Jonathan Mayberry, who's a terrific writer. And that uh, book that you have has about a dozen different stories that take place in the V world universe and really set up that universe. Um, so that's the one we're going to talk about a little bit uh, today. But we've also done some licensed prose books as well. The G.I. Joe book you see here, and we're about to do a Rocketeer book that comes out uh, this summer also. So the prose publishing comes from my passion as a publisher because I like books. Um, my girlfriend, actually, we were walking around Seattle the other day and, and uh, went to the public library, and they had a little button that said Book Nerd. And so she's very pleased with herself to get that button and put it on me. So um, it's actually on my jacket over here. So I am, I am a book nerd. Even my girlfriend says so. Um, and, and I'm happy to be a book nerd. And, and that's really what drives us to be in this prose business is that I just like books. And, and um, I like comic books, of course, but I also like books with lots of words. And, and that's why we're doing this. So we, ha we have three new divisions that I'm going to quickly talk about. Uh, we launched a division called IDW Limited. And this, is again, is a physical-only product. So what this is is these are really expensive books. And the reason they're really expensive is it takes a traditional hardcover from us and then puts it into a gravity box, which if you're not familiar with, it's kind of like a jewelry box. It holds a, it's a box that holds a book. So it has this really super fancy box. Then it also, in many cases, comes with original art. So when you buy the book, you get this nice box for it, and you also get a piece of original art that comes with that book. And in all cases, the books are also all hand-signed by the creators that worked on them. So in the case of this book, this Transformers book, our Transformers freelancers are literally based around the world. There are, they are in Italy, they're in Canada, they're in Australia, of course here in the US. This book had lots of artists that worked on it, so these tip-in plates had to be shipped around the world. So if you're gonna buy this book, you're gonna get a tip-in tip -in plate by all the creators, uh, you're going to get a piece of original art and this nice gravity box, and you have a very unique collectible. There's only a couple hundred of these, and they're, when they're gone, there's going to be no more. So it's something that you can own. It's something that, you know, so, so if you're a really big Transformers fan, it's something you'd be really proud of to have in your collection. Uh, but again, really expensive, up to, up to $500. This is really only for the, for the really hardcore fan, either of these artists or of these brands. And, and there is, of course, no digital version of this. There's no way to deliver original art digitally that uh, I can think of. Um, we also have IDW Entertainment, and IDW Entertainment is going to focus on the development of television. So the reason we started this division is a little complicated, but if you're a rights holder like me, meaning that I own, I own intellectual property or I co-own intellectual property with, with the creator, I'm typically, if I'm doing a deal in Hollywood, say the 30 Days of Night deal that, that resulted in the movie from Sony, I'm, I, when I do that deal, what I'm doing is I'm essentially selling them the rights to my property. They're going to pay me some amount of money, and then I'm stepping out of the picture. And that's OK if the check is big enough and the thing actually gets made, like in the case of 30 days a night. But where that's not OK is when the check's not very big or when you give them the rights and they don't ever actually do anything with it. And the truth is, is that that's what happens in Hollywood 99% of the time. So if you're a comics fan and you follow comics news, you'll see that almost every day there's three or four things that are announced as being developed as a TV show or as a movie. That's all, those things are all almost across the board never going to happen. You know, out of 100, 99 of those are not going to happen. It's just the simple reality of the way Hollywood does it. And the reason for that is Hollywood has a big appetite for content, right? 
and they have giant budgets. So they could go to a show like this and they could gobble up all these rights for less than what they spend to advertise Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at 7-Eleven during the movie release. I mean, it's just literally this, the size of the scale that they have to spend is so much bigger than the, than the size of, of our, any, of, any of our budgets as publishers. So, so it's a long way of saying that I found that process really frustrating. We, um, uh, I mentioned before my book, Lock and Key, which is by Joe Hill and, and Gabe Rodriguez. It's a book I'm really proud to publish. I think it's a terrific book. We sold the TV rights to 20th TV um, to develop it as a TV show. And they did, they made a pilot, which means that they actually went and filmed a one hour pilot for Fox, um, for Fox broadcast. Right up to the day where they were gonna make the decision of the schedule, what, what Fox was gonna broadcast that year, everybody said, oh, they're going to series on Lock and Key, this is gonna be a TV show, right? But then the day of what's called the upfronts where they announced their schedule, they made the decision not to do Lock and Key. And, and that was their decision because they bought those rights from me. I didn't have any say in that decision because I said, okay, here, you can pay me this money and now you get to go do what you wanna do with it. But even though I understood the way that the game was played, it was a really frustrating process for me because the pilot was really good and the show should have aired. And what has happened since that time is a lot of dark TV has done extremely well on Fox. So things like The Following or American Horror Story, which is on FX. So it was a bad decision uh, by the person who made that decision. But I, I had no control of it and there's no way to go back and unring that bell. So what we're gonna do now is actually put our own money on the table. So when you start using your own money, instead of taking money from other people, it completely changes the game. It changes the way that everything happens. So what we're doing is developing our own TV, meaning that in the early stages, we are hiring writers to do pilot scripts and series formats, which is essentially an outline for a whole series. And then once we have something that we decide we wanna, that we wanna pursue, we're gonna go out and sell the international distribution first. So we'll bring on international partners to, to, sell, to broadcast the show around the world. Then we'll bring on a domestic partner, but they'll only have specific rights. And so instead of me going to them and saying, you can buy my property for this small amount of money and remove me, what I'm now saying is, you can, you can borrow my TV show for a specific period of time on very specific formats. And so it's completely changing that equation of the control I have and, and what I can do with that program. So, so if you look at a TV budget, there's, uh, say it's a million dollar show per episode, which would be low, but just for argument, say it's a million dollars per episode. I can, go to the rest of the, I can go to the rest of the world outside of the US, outside of the domestic networks and say, we want, we want to raise 300,000 out of that million. So now I'm down to 700. Go to a domestic network and say, okay, you can have this, these very specific rights for another 300. So now I'm down to 400. So, I can go, now I have my million, I started my million, I've raised 600, I got 400 per episode I, gotta, I still gotta pay for. Well, the nice thing about the way the US is working right now, there are a bunch of tax subsidies where people are trying to encourage this sort of business to happen. So I can go to all kinds of places, uh, Atlanta, for example, and shoot a show, which is where The Walking Dead is shot, and shoot a show there and get a tax subsidy, probably in the form of, again, for argument's sake, sake let's say 200. So now I've raised 800 out of my million per episode. So that 200 gap, I'm also gonna finance. So, so I'm taking the financial risk on developing these shows. And again, the reason being not just for the control, but that's in, in, in success, that's where the real profit lies. So, um, so anyhow, so that's what we're doing on TV. And, and certainly VWARS is a, is a big part of that. Uh, we also have a board game division. I'm gonna skip over this, although this is other than to say that we're not doing video games here, we're doing big box board games. So $50, $60 board games. Um, v Wars will of course be part of this. The first thing that we're doing is a, a game based off of our work, Kill Shakespeare, which is a really fun series. Uh, the creators are here. If you have a chance, you should stop by and say hi to them. They're, uh, they're really good guys. We did a Kickstarter for Kill Shakespeare. So there was a digital, sort of a, a quasi-digital component to the Kill, Kill Shakespeare board game because we did do a Kickstarter for that. Um, I just realized that's actually a really old uh, box design, so I'm not sure what that's about. But uh, So V Wars. So this is the book that you have. So the premise behind V Wars started, as I said, as a what's called a shared world anthology edited by Jonathan Mayberry. And so that basically means that Jonathan went out and hired a bunch of writers to help him create a brand new world. And in this world, what happens is, is that climate change and global warming leads to an outbreak of a new virus. And this, what this virus does is it causes junk DNA to be unlocked for the people who are infected by it. And that junk DNA causes them, the, the people who are infected and the people who end up uh, getting this disease end up becoming some version of a vampire. But what sets our, our world apart from the other vampire stories is, is that 
that, that it looks at how vampires have existed culturally all over the world. So the way this disease manifests for a Native American is different than the way it manifests for somebody from Japan or somebody from South America. And the reality is, in, in, in our real world, those myths are all different. So there, there is a version of the vampire mythology all over the world. And it's interesting that, that, that in, for, this is not a story, this is for real. Those mythologies are all very different. They all, they all revolve, of course, around the blood-sucking component of vampires, but the rest of the mythology is all very different. So in, in, the, in the vampire mythology that we think of, it's, you know, they can't come out at night, and the garlic, and, you know, they have to be invited into the house, all those kinds of things. But in, in other mythologies, it's very different. They're, you know, in the um, uh, Japanese mythology, the vampires transform into these giant beings, and they, can, they, don't, they don't have to worry about um, being in, in the day or the night, and they don't actually even suck blood. They suck life force. So they're, they're actually eating your energy, not your actual physical blood. So, so anyhow, so this is a, this is a really interesting world that, that Mayberry created. And what, and what I, and if you like the book, I hope you, I hope you'll give the book a chance, read a chapter or two. What's interesting about the way the, the stories are told in the form of the V Wars anthology is that each character comes from a different genetic background. So they have a different cultural background. And the story is told through the viewpoint of each of these individual characters and how this virus causes them to manifest into vampires. So, so there's this overriding story of, well, how did the virus get introduced and what's happening in, from a global standpoint in the world, but it's really interesting because it's character driven because you're looking at what happens, you know, imagine if any of us were just to all of a sudden turn into a vampire. It's, it's, very, it's very grounded in, in a very interesting way of looking at the, at the world. So, um, and of course, what happens is the people who are not infected or the people who are infected but don't end up becoming vampires, there's lots of humans left, but now much of the world has turned into vampires and that's what leads to the title V Wars. So there is a, ultimately a war between the infected and the non-infected. So that's what the, the bigger story is about. So we launched it as a novel, as a, as a shared world anthology novel. Then we're going to do it as comic books, because this is, of course, what we're best known for as comic books. The first issue is a zero issue, which is the one you see on the left there. That cover is actually by Kevin Eastman, who's the co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and a good friend of IDW. So that book is going to be available on free comic book day, which is the first Saturday in May. And uh, you can get that for free at your comic store, again, assuming that you are over the age of, I guess, 18 or 21, whatever, uh, whatever your uh, reading age is for adult material. Um, and this, this is launch force in a really big way. So this is, this is for us to be able to get behind a product and make it our free comic book day comic means that IDW is supporting this and we're shipping, I think something like 60 or 70,000 copies of this to give away during free comic book day. So it's a way for us to launch this property in a big way. It's immediately followed up by the first issue, which is the guy's hand that's uh, coming at you there. And that book will actually be in stores the same week that the free comic book day happens. So um, that first Saturday in May, the, the retail version of the product will be there as well. So our hope is people get the free comic, they like it, and then they have that opportunity to buy that first issue. So, uh, and then of course we launch on to issues two, three, and hopefully we'll be uh, issue 200 someday. So we're doing it as prose novels and comic books. Physical versions, of course, for those, but also digital. So there's, a, there's of course, ebooks. If you decide you want to, you, you're reading your V Wars book that I gave you, and you decide you want to read that on your iPad, you can, you can easily get that book, or for your Kindle. The comic books, of course, will be available digitally in all the ways that we sell them. Uh, then we're going to do a board game. This will come out later this year. This will only be a physical product. There will be no digital version of this. And then we're also going to be working on, and we are working on, a TV show version of V Wars, which. Um, which is a cheat as far as my definition of digital culture as far as going, because I said that TV shows shouldn't be, shouldn't be considered digital culture. But ultimately, this, this property will, be, if we have our way, be on your TV screens. And what's nice about that is, again, even though it's not in my definition of digital culture, it does, it's part of those waves. Because if a TV show happens, like you saw with The Waking Dead, Walking Dead, those, those waves can become tsunamis as far as the opportunity to bring new people to these properties. And so if you look at, if we can get a TV show on the air and it's even marginally successful, all of a sudden now we're talking about reaching a magnitude of readers compared to what we can hit with that prose book or those comic books. So, so and it's not, but it's not just a, for me it's not just a commercial reason or a profit driven reason. It's that we, we're trying to create something fun. We're trying to create a property that we own with Mayberry, trying to introduce it into the world in a big way. And TV development is part of that program for us. It's not the be all and end all. It is an insuccessful way to reach a lot of people, but, it, but it's not, you know, that we would be publishing these books even if we weren't developing it as a TV show at the same time. So, 
Um, so that's pretty much what I had to say. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this inaugural session of the inaugural uh, Comics and Digital Culture Series here at Emerald City Comic Con. Uh, big thank you to Ted Adams and uh, the... <laughs> yes, indeed.